you brought up this notion of living with ambiguity and uncertainty yes. um, right. a couple of times. And I know that well, there were a couple of things in the writing I wanted to ask you about it that I think is related to this is the idea of um, being a doer in the classroom. Yes. And also the notion of living, I think you call it living in the question. That seemed to me to be, I mean, when I was thinking and trying to answer that that question, which I've never really set about to try, you know, what's different about the class? Mm. You know, I just went off in the direction of, you know, like you're doing something you want to do, mm-hmm. only you just happen to be in this setting and it, it doesn't disturb anything because it's what you'd be doing if you were home, you know, like lying on your back as I too frequently am now. Um, there's where my mind is. That's where, and doing it is, I've tried to make that analogy that it's like doing anything that you love we were talking about. You know, the cello, you know, I could see some teacher not teaching anything but being a really talented, skillful cellist and bringing the cello to class and let the kids touch it, you know, and making sound out of it and say, that's class, this is it, I'm going to make music. And, you know, you could ask me questions about it and if you're interested in learning, I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. And my thing is pursuing ideas, you know, like and trying to look at things from a fresh perspective, altering the perspective. That, that's good for Foucault because that's what he does, I think. He takes the conventional and moves it 20 degrees and everything changes when you do that. And you have to have the guts to do it. Why does it take guts, you think? Because you're leaving the tried, the true, and mm-hmm. the um, comfortable behind. Mm-hmm. And you're going off. I mean, any time you say something you know, to, to a class, or it doesn't have to be a class, it could be in any group. Even in a cocktail party, did you ever... I mean, it's happened to me so many times. Inappropriate conversation, people will tell me. Why are you doing that? You know, like I'll say dialectical materialism is crap, you know, like, and it's not worthy of an intelligent person, you know, or something like that. What? (laughs) (laughs) You see, but the minute you do that, you know, you're putting yourself on the line, you know, like, and uh, you're outside the comfort zone. And then you become a social pariah, too, at the same time. And not everybody, you know, I mean, is willing to become that because we are so tribal. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be outside? So as a teacher, Mm -hmm. part of your goal is to do this, move move people 20 degrees or get them out of their comfort zone. That's right. um, And give them a different perspective. Yes. That line I took from Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. What is a philosopher who doesn't disturb anybody? Mm. What is a teacher that doesn't provoke anybody? If everybody's comfortable there, if you're just processing a curriculum, you're you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Stay home. (laughs) I I think I mentioned also in what I wrote something that I actually did. I asked some of my colleagues at this particular institution, why are you teaching? What do you hope to gain out of your class? And most of them had never thought about that. Really, the the truth of the matter is some of them are good people, some of them are not, some competent, some not. But they're there because they did well in those subjects in college, and there's no other reason. Like, they don't have any commitment to chemistry, they're just teaching chemistry. Like, what are you supposed to get out of chemistry anyhow? Do you know? I feel like saying, why bother this? Want a succession of units that follow each other in a textbook, and you try for coverage. Well, do you feel like an adult doing this? I wouldn't. It's somebody else's stuff. You decide what you should teach, shouldn't you? Because you think it's important. I was, uh, I've had a really graphic example of that. It's come to home. That's what's fun, because wherever you go, those things follow you. So I'm at chemo. Not a pleasant place to be, <laughs> which I think is very funny. This is funny. <laughs> Because I was the only thin person there, except for one other guy, and I think he had AIDS, not cancer. And all these fat people with cancer who are, you know, like, they're hooked up to their IVs, and they're just eating, and, and you know, they, they, they come in in wheelchairs. They don't move at all, you know, like, I, they have treatable ones, obviously, not like mine, which there's nothing you can do except die with dignity. But... They would, their nurses would show them their um, most recent printouts on like a CT scan or an MRI or something. 
and they would get jubilant when they saw uh, any particular uh, result, which was better than the last one that they had. You know where I'm going with this? They, you know, they're grasping at straws, you see. And when I'm trying to think, this is the connection to science. I know it's circuitous. I'm like that. But it's really going to come to science. Error theory came into my mind. Like, what good is one reading in anything? It's no, no value. The, what you should have learned from any science you ever took is that there are no absolutes. You need a neighborhood. You establish a neighborhood you know, of values, and it's the statistical average that matters. So a blip on the screen... Is a, no. Can you explain again about the difference between a blip on a chart? Yeah, a blip on a chart, like you... Uh, you take one reading is never good anywhere in science. It's not good in a physical lab. It's not good in a biological lab. It's not good anywhere. A reading doesn't matter. Don't give me, you know, one example. Don't give me two. Give me different examples from different times of the day taken over three months. And then we'll average it. And if the average comes out to, you know, anywhere near 120 over 80, then we won't say you have hot blood pressure anymore. But don't give me a number, you jerk. <laughs> So, so you do see science as something that can put a check on this kind of abuse of yeah. you know, knowledge. It yeah. has a certain yeah. self-corrective mechanism mm -hmm. that the, the free market is supposed to have, which doesn't, but I mean, it does have that. And I'm not saying it's perfect. And right. Western science has done a lot of damage. I'm not, you know, I'm not an apologist. I'm not an apologist for anything. I don't like that position. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a critic. That's what I like. <laughs> That's what turns me on. Criticism. Yeah, it mm -hmm. does. It, I like, you know, I stand there with the pin and people walk by with balloons. And that's, <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> okay. So that, actually, that's, that's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, okay, you're um, someone who has that rare capacity to self-generate this new perspective and you're always Keep changing yeah you're always changing mm. you're constantly going across the dial right yeah. some of your questions <laughs> reminded me how much i have uh -huh. earlier ones you know with relativism and all that. <laughs> right so that mm. you, you you think about something and then you become a critic of that way of thinking and then you so you keep going around right yeah, move to something else <laughs> right and so that's that sort of that's your drive. That's yeah. what propels you, right? Yes, because I always mm -hmm. feel that um, no matter how long I spend doing it, I've always gone someplace and I've encompassed, you know, something new mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, then I don't ever have anything new. And I like novelty. Right, right. And I don't mind also just saying, you know, like that didn't work. I thought it worked. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're born with this. I'm presumably you're born with this mm. capacity, this gift to be able to have yeah. that fresh perspective. Because most people actually kind of they do get stymied, they get comfortable, they get complacent, yes. and they want to stay that way. It's like yes. the opposite of what you do. Yes, that may maybe mm -hmm. the answers to that may be partially psychological. Not that I'm a psychologistic thinker, but you know the fact that you know the world that I inherited, mm -hmm. you know, that I was born into and became accustomed to was unstable and unsatisfying. I mean, I took uh, something that was a vice and turned it into a virtue. <laughs> I, I made it my own. Your world meaning your family life? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah my original family life was mm -hmm. very, very bad. Mm -hmm. It was awful. Mm -hmm. So you think that was formed in reaction? <laughs> It's possible. Possible. I mean, it's, you know, it's neither here nor there, those kinds of things, you know. But it was a uh, unreliable world. So I, you know, and that's the only one I had. So I sort of got used to saying, well, okay, you know, unreliable isn't so bad after all, you know. <laughs> you, it, it gives you something else. And I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that also mean, though, that if you're constantly getting a new perspective and you're constantly moving across that dial and you're critical, that you're never really at rest? You're never... That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. The one, you know, like, disagreeable component of that is um, anger. Mm. 